all I knew about my grandpa was my mom's dad was, uh, uh, he grew up in an orf orphanage, the orphanage burned down, don't know anything about him, about his life, about his, you know, when his birthday was, um, but he always had a really good tan and, and I didn't understand why. Uh, but, um, and then, you know, then he died, but then, uh, then later, uh, I mean, like literally like, you know, uh, three, four years ago, I was talking to my sister and, sh and she mentioned my great grandma being black. And I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, what well, great grandma? I don't know who you're talking about. Yeah. And so she had gone back and like unearthed a bunch of stuff and talked to my mom. And, and so my, my, my great grandma was black married a white guy in West Virginia. And this was like early 1900s. Yeah. Uh, Slightly faux pas. Yeah. Yeah. Not, <laughs> not, not a great place to have an interracial relationship. Yeah. And uh, my, my great grandpa got called to, uh, got uh, called to the war and uh, which left my great grandma raising my grandpa wow. uh, in West Virginia by herself. And it was tragic because when my grandpa left, the everyone in the town refused to feed her like nobody would sell her groceries nobody would would let her like would give her food from their farms no, no like like re refused to feed her wow. and she starved to death and that's how my great grandma died and that's how my grandpa ended up in an orphanage <laughs> This next cat is somebody that I ran across on the internet one day as I was looking for something interesting and new to learn. Shout out to Film Courage, by the way, the YouTube channel is where I found this next guest. I listened to a few hours of material that this cat had, and he just spoke to me because I had all these ideas that I wanted to organize into some kind of a business, and he managed to explain it in a matter of minutes. And then expound upon it, of course, and use different examples and different versions of some of those ways in which we could expand those ideas and turn them into businesses. This isn't just for someone that wants to make a business. This is for people who love storytelling, who love a success story from someone that pulled up the bootstraps and moved to L.A. and started to do groundbreaking work. Um, this guy's become a dear friend and somebody that I've actually collaborated with on. But this podcast is also not about my projects at all whatsoever. I really want you to learn about this guy's fascinating, smart, innovative, uh, a trendsetter with the transmedia uh, segment, which is something that usually needs a long explanation, but we seek to make it a quick and easy version here. Can't wait to introduce you to Houston Howard on the TCAST. I guess uh, the the best place to start would be like you're from you're a Kentucky guy. Yes, originally from Kentucky. Right. So, and you end up being a thought leader in a transmedia space in L.A. How yeah. how does a guy from Kentucky that would be probably voted the least likely to be <laughs> such a creative that he's impacting an industry a, across the board? How how does that sure trajectory happen? Yeah, yeah. I was I've always been a creative guy uh all through high school and through school i was uh a heavy writer i was uh a playwright uh in college i uh, played a lot of tabletop role-playing games i played a lot of video games uh wrote a lot of short stories things like that uh so it was always creative i ended up going to law school uh after college uh, i went to college in west virginia went to law school in virginia and uh, while I was there, I, I focused on intellectual property litigation, specifically in the film industry. And so that's when I really started focusing on film and television and the music industry to some extent. And um, and while I was there, I I got to do a practicum with the film school that was also in the same university, uh, doing a lot of rights clearance stuff uh, for the, the student films that they were doing which then hooked me up with a lot of the filmmaker students at the university. And then while I was in law school, started producing uh, and writing films while I was in law school. 
uh which was which was a crazy experience as if there's a lot of extra time i mean first yeah, of all, in all my spare so time. what made you you sound like you had uh well did you have aspirations to get into the creative industry and and wh uh, how did you yeah. end up picking law school for heaven's sake so uh i picked law school primarily because uh i you know Growing up in Eastern Kentucky, right where Ohio, West Virginia, uh, and Kentucky kind of butt together, uh, it's it's uh, you know a very middle class, lower middle class uh, place. Um, nobody in my family has had ever graduated from college. Um, we grew up either lower middle class or upper lower class, depending on the year, I guess. Uh, my We were single income. My dad was worked on the railroad for 40 years and and uh, and supported us. Uh, so we never had a lot. And uh, uh, we, you know, we weren't poverty stricken, but, you know, you could feel it. And uh, and I just realized in high school that I, you know, I was smart and I like to argue a lot with people and debate <laughs> things. And, and I thought, Hey, this could, this could, uh, if I become a lawyer, I could, um, make a lot of money and, um, change the trajectory of like my family's legacy. Oh, right. And so it was really just a, like a monetary calculation. Uh, and it seemed interesting. So, uh, applied to, uh, law school, went to law school of Virginia beach, Virginia, and, uh, loved it. I actually really, really enjoyed law school um and did well and uh it it was it was an interesting journey because i never at that point you know i was focused on being a lawyer and won a bunch of awards in law school etc cetera, etc cetera. but then going into my last semester of my third year which is the last year that you go to in law school um the the script just flipped for me and it uh you know I, it was interesting because i i saw a uh, i saw a postcard in a store, which was a retail store, it was a postcard you could buy, and it said, "What would you do if you knew you could never fail?" And I, that was like a really super intriguing question for me, and and I and I asked myself that, and it wasn't going to a law firm and <laughs> yeah. look at the contracts all day, right? Like yeah. it's it, it wasn't that, and it was like this really interesting, uh, you know, cathartic moment of like wow wait a minute like that's not what i would do what would i do i would make movies and uh, uh create stuff and write and uh that's what i would do if if money was no option and if i had all the money in the world what what, what would i do and and that and, and it was it was more creative stuff and, and and i had been gravitating to that slowly right uh and uh then just decided you know, I, and it's funny because I, I just won this thing called the Virginia Trial Lawyers Award. It's almost like the uh, it's like the Heisman Trophy for trial lawyers in, in the state of Virginia. And uh, and, and so it, the reason I say that, not to brag myself, but like my family and my wife's family, everyone's was super excited about me being a lawyer because they thought I was going to do well. And then I, you know, went to my wife. I was like, hey, you know what? I think, you know, we need to pray about this and see, see if the Lord is redirecting some stuff, cause I don't think I'm supposed to be a lawyer. And, and my wife's super cool about stuff like that. She's like, okay, that's like, and we've kind of prayed it through and got some direction. And, and we just decided to um, put everything in the back of our Jetta and drive to LA and just see wow. what we could do and then not okay. practice law. Uh, much to my mother-in-law's chagrin, uh, the, you know, I took her daughter across the country and decided not to be a lawyer on a Hollywood <laughs> dream, right? It's not, not, not great for mother-in-law uh a relationship but um but but it, but it worked out because it you know law school was great and uh being a lawyer and and having that degree is so valuable in the way you think and the way you approach problems and the way you you analyze issues hmm. um you know i would say half the people that get a law degree don't practice law uh, they'll go to the FBI or they'll go into politics or they'll, you know, become sports agents or or something. Um, but what law school is interesting because law school isn't about teaching you the law. Law school, because you learn the law after you graduate and you're studying for the bar exam, uh, you uh, you you get the law in your state wherever you're going to take the bar exam. And then and you have like three months to learn it all. Right. What what law school does is it teaches you how to think. They like just open your head up and rearrange your brain and teach you 
better ways to think and to dissect issues and to analyze issues and to crit critically think through issues. And, um, and, and you think completely differently than you did when you started, which is why you're able to learn the law on the, on the outside. Uh, but so, so taking that into the film industry, I didn't know anybody didn't have a, didn't have a resume. Uh, I, I, I thought about going into USC into pr the producers program, uh, but then didn't and just thought I would give it a go self-educated myself. And when I started looking at the entertainment industry, there's a lot of problems and issues with the, with the film industry and the entertainment industry. And that rubric of thought that I was using as a lawyer was allowed me to kind of dissect some issues that, that the industry was running into and, you know, allowed me to then cobble together a different way forward. And that's kind of, and then I started down that path of, of entertainment but not just regular entertainment but a sort of disruptive form of entertainment right yeah. which is so by showing up and seeing what was there you're already outside the box yeah essentially 100%. what you're saying 100 percent. so uh, how did you is your wife a creative as well she go and do stuff like that too? yeah 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 she yeah we're both creative and uh you know different kinds of creative but she you know she's she's definitely like-minded in a lot of that so we were always like you know uh, it, in both of our families, we're sort of the odd ducks when it comes to that, right? So, you know, we make a good team that way. So, so, um, and you, at what point did you start coming up with the transmedia concept and how yeah. did you actually implement it and turn it into a business? Sure. So, uh, you know, when, when I, I, I'm a, I'm a child of the eighties and the nineties. And so I grew up on star Wars and reading Lord of the Rings and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and gi joe and uh you know saturday morning cartoons and the whole thing that was that was my whole world growing up and so i've always been a fan of multi-platform entertainment because that's that's what everything was and i remember buying the he-man action figures and getting the comic book with the action figures and then watching the he-man cartoons on saturday morning and and then there was the he-man movie with uh uh who was it Dolph lundgren uh with, with it was terrible uh but like you like you know that was that was normal entertainment for me and that's what i grew up in and so when i got into uh when i got into hollywood i wanted to create things that i was a fan of and so i and 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 you know, that was entertainment that existed on different platforms and in an interesting ecosystem. And I always had like a, you know, sort of a, before I knew there was a discipline or a model that really supported it, you know, th this is always just my instinct of, of, you know, how do we, how do we push boundaries? How do we push a little further? How do we, I've never been, you know, my mom was always, always really good at instilling uh, in, in me a confidence of just trying stuff and experimentation. Doesn't matter if anybody's done it before, just like try it and see what happens. And so I've never been afraid of, of just like, you know, noodling around with different models. When I was in law school and I was, I, I wrote, I wrote a, a film and was producing that film. It's a 30 minute film. And um, it was interesting because the, the film is not a lot of dialogue. You're, you're uh, there's, there's a guy doing a, doing a thing, but you, you, you don't really get his thoughts a lot because uh, it's a really quiet film. Uh, and so when I went to go, I wanted an original song to be produced for the film. Uh, I went to the, to the songwriter and uh, said, hey, can you do this original song? But can you write the lyrics from a perspective of what is going on in the mind of this character? Uh, so that we can kind of hear some of these thoughts throughout the the film uh, because you're not getting it from the film. And then it would be like a title track, but also be an extension of the story in a really interesting way. Yeah. Uh, and and he did. And it was awesome. Um, but then when we were producing the film on set, uh, I thought uh, it would be cool if while we have the setups and the scene set, then let's go ahead and shoot the music video in there uh, on the same sets. And, uh, and so then it would be nice continuity with the music. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And then, um, and then I thought, well, part of the, part of the, the story of this, there's one character that you realize is this demon character that's, that's been a demon the whole time, but nobody else knows it until the end. It's this little twist. Um, and, and actually people don't see her though. You think the people see her. Uh, and then I thought, well, that might be interesting if the guy, when he's shooting, when we're shooting the video, if he's not just sitting on the set, uh, sitting on the sets, 
He's actually in the background when the actors are doing the rehearsals. Uh, and, and and then I'm thinking, OK, what if we actually then shoot a different angle and actually show a new part of the scene that you can't get from the film? And so it just I just keep like adding to it <laughs> that, you know, made Obsessing my almost, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. I'm like, oh, what else can we do? Like, what's the extra thing made my director go insane and all this. But like, you know, th but that's how just instinctively, I think. Um, and then when I got into Hollywood, I started to then dive into, okay, how do I create more broad based entertainment that can be music and film and uh, games and publishing and the whole thing. Um, and it was incredibly difficult. And, and uh, when I attempted to do it, it wasn't working right. It didn't feel like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, felt like. And that's when I decided to stop and do a, like a two year forensic audit on every multi platform project I could ever come up with. And, you know, from all the ones I listed when I was a kid to Harry Potter to Star Trek to everything else. And I really started to look at what made them take creatively, what made them take as a business model, what were the creative decisions that really propelled them, what were the creative decisions that didn't work, what were the business decisions that worked and didn't work. And, and I just started like got a spreadsheet and started like marking stuff down. And, you know, this is using my lawyer superpowers. So I started just to see trends and started to see commonalities and started to see, oh, okay, well, all the best ones all made these eight similar decisions and all the worst ones made these 14 similar decisions. So being the genius that I am, I said, I'm just going to do the good stuff and not the bad stuff. Right. And, um, and that, and, and, and that led me to writing my first book. And of like, hey, there's these eight things you should always do. And uh, not I didn't invent them. It's just other people invent them. I'm just kind of putting them together and kind of creating a roadmap and uh, published that book called um, Make Your Story Really Stinking Big, published by Michael Weesey. Did really well. It was the first book on the market that actually that that had that thesis of process of process. Uh, all the other transmedia books at the, at the time and, and the transmedia thought was very academic. It was very theoretical. It was very a lot of super smart people really looking at the history of multi-platform stuff and uh but for me i'm a super practical guy and there wasn't a lot of practicality for me and so i really wanted to say okay well that's great i get it but i don't want to pontificate i want to do and so you know how do we do that how do, how do we do that part and um uh and that's what that book was uh and then once i published that book that really kind of launched me into that trajectory and then you're able more. to get hired to consult and do on different projects. Yeah, it was cool. Two weeks after two weeks after I um, published the book, after it hit the, the bookshelves, um, I got a call from uh, Dave Voss, who was a senior VP of product and design at Mattel and said, hey, Houston, uh, uh, we read your book and we'd like to come in and uh, we'd like you to come in and, and talk about, you know, a, a project that we have. Mm -hmm. And it was like unbelievable. It was like the easiest business development I've ever done because uh, I'm not a sales guy. And, and so like, I struggle with sort of sales aspect of like, Hey, I'm Houston, hire me, things like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and this was, this was somebody calling me and it was, and I, I give a credit to, to, to this guy I talked to. He's, he's one of the richest guy in, in LA. So this crazy guy, he, he's a big real estate guy in LA. And I was talking to him at a conference, met him, we were kind of chatting and, and I asked him, I was like, Hey man, what was it, like one piece of advice that you would give me? Just, you know, I know you're not in entertainment, just like how, like, what would you what would you tell me just to help me be successful? And because success leaves clues and I like to learn from it doesn't yeah. matter who they are. And uh, he said, you need to write a book. And, uh, and I was like, OK, he said, here's the thing about books. He said, when your name is on a book, people think you're an expert. And he said, they'll never read your book because people don't read. <clears throat> but if your name is on the book, they think you're a content expert. And then instead of a business card, you hand them the book. He said, if you hand them a business card, they'll throw it away. We don't keep business cards, but no one ever throws away a book. He said, no matter how ugly the book or irrelevant the book or useless the book, people will find some spot on their bookshelf to, to put it on. And your name's right there on the spine. Displayed. And, and if they ever happen to like fall into the space that, in which you're talking, your name's right there and they'll, and they'll, they'll give you a call. And, and, and I thought that just sounds ludicrous and way too easy, but, but I decided, decided to take him up on this. Okay. I have this insight. I have this instinct. I have this thesis in my head. Uh, 
let's let's give it a try. And so uh, so I wrote it up and um, sent it to the uh, the publisher that I really liked, a, a trade publisher called Michael Weesey, who who specifically specifically publishes film related books. And um, it was the only publisher I sent it to. And they were like, we'll take it. And it was like I first try. Right. Just like it was first at bat home run. Super excited. Yeah. And uh, because originally I was just going to self publish because because um, I really didn't care about the wide distribution. I just wanted it to, to be a business card for me. So when I met people, I said, here's a book. Uh, but I thought, you know what? I'll just send it off and see what happens. They picked it up wide distribution and and then it went from there. So so give the, all the credit to that crazy rich guy that I talked to. Uh, <laughs> but, but I tell people that all the time of like, if you have a unique insight, the barrier to entry to write a book is so low, like, you know, figure out how how to do that. I was talking to a guy um, recently it was a, a, a kid in film school and uh, he was like, how do I how do I position myself? He's getting ready to graduate. And he was like, how do I pos position myself differently than the other, you know, 30,000 kids doing the same thing? Yeah. You know, and and I was like, what you got to find, like, what's your unique insight? Like, what's make you unique that other people don't have? And what was really interesting about this kid is he had worked eight years at that point, eight years. He started as a 14, 15 year old working in luxury hotels. And he had been uh, and, and still even through film school working at luxury hotels mm -hmm. in, in Hollywood. Montage Hotel was where he was at at that point. And um and he has, you know, if you've ever been to a luxury hotel or knows people worked at luxury hotels, they have this like crazy sense of like customer service and luxury hospitality people just have their own weird over the top. Yeah. yeah right. Over serve. Yeah. And and um, and uh, and I was like, how has that informed your approach to producing a movie? Like, yeah, and has it informed like how you operate on set or, you know, anything like that. And then he's just started talking about all this really super interesting philosophy of how he how he operates on the film sets that, that he produces in a way like he's operating in a luxury hotel, the way he treats people, the, all this stuff. And I was like, there, take that angle. Do like the, the hospitality filmmaker. And it's unique, too. Because, That's it. You know. <laughs> Yeah, if you ever been on the film set and everybody's screaming at each other, it's like it's it's pressure. Yes. Like people don't operate that way. Yeah. And and I was like, it's super unique hospitality filmmaker. I was like, who cares if it ultimately bears out over the long term or not? It gives you a unique positioning, and, and he did it and it worked and it's really interesting. So, uh, so 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 I did that early and was able to get into Mattel, and and I'll never forget it when, when they when I went into uh to them they um I was sitting there. And I thought I was just going to talk, talk to this guy, like, you know, about this project. And, and I was sitting there and, and if you go to Mattel, it's like, you know, it's like Willy Wonka factory inside, right? They have like, <laughs> they have like life-size matchbox cars or hot wheels cars. Oh, wow. Uh, they have a whole like track, like a hot wheels track. That's like a real life track. That is like where you drive the actual hot wheels goes crazy. Like all this what stuff. you would imagine. It's a, yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right? Awesome. Super cool. I was sitting there. And I was sitting in like this uh, this hallway, and I was supposed to to talk to these guys uh, in this other room. And it wasn't just one guy; it was like all the Mattel creative teams, like thirteen folks. And I just hear this like booming bass that's just like in this room, like somebody's like playing something. It was just like you know vibrating everything. And Ridley Scott's transmedia company was in there like doing a pitch. And then I realized, oh, they're bringing a bunch of people in here on a little dog and pony show, kind of interviewing people who to work with. And and I got super intimidated because it's really like, Scott's transmedia company. Yeah, and I don't have a yeah, I don't, I don't real, have a pitch. I'm just here to talk to people. I just got my book. That's all I had. I didn't have, I didn't have anything at all. And uh they, you know, Ridley Scott's got all, all their guys walk out and and uh uh and I go in and it was it was super interesting because I told him, I said, guys, I didn't bring anything. I don't have anything. And um and I said, I got this book, so why don't you tell me about your project and what's going on? And there were, it was a sh super long table and there were 13 people in there and we sat there for about three hours, uh, just like talking shop about the, about the project. And they, they're okay. This is what we're dealing with. This is the problem. And, and we got cartoons and we got books and we got a web series, but the, the, the fans aren't migrating from the cartoon to the books and we don't understand this. And, um, and I, because of this rubric that I put together, I was able to diagnose the problem, mm. like their problem quickly. Unpack it and say, this is why, and give them good ideas. 100%.
right? I was like, oh yeah, well, this is the problem. Like this, this, this. And if you change this and swap this around and go this direction, it's going to work. And then we just did that for three hours. And, and it was interesting because, you know, uh, I didn't make it about me. Here's my real, here's all my stuff. I made it about them and their problem, how to fix their problem. And, and that, you know, got me the gig with, with them. And, and at that point, then I started to really, you know, make it, then I was able to just leverage that in other, in other things, obviously. Right. So, and so what kind of projects were you, in, were you taking on at that point? Cause a lot of the study you did was on established sure. brands, Yep, essentially. So tell me about some of your experiences and taking something from the ground and then producing it tra or transforming it. Yeah. So really my whole focus at that time is, was just internal development of, uh, how do I get my own projects off the ground? And, uh, it, it was super interesting because we kept it, you know, we kept hitting this roadblock of, of it's not established IP. And when you're talking about, you know, film and television, we're talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars that go into this stuff. And, uh, and everybody's super risk averse, uh, in Hollywood. It's, it's a culture of fear. It's a culture of. Uh, how do I just keep my job for another couple months before I'll inevitably get fired? Uh, because that's just what happens. And so everybody's making defensive positions. Nobody really wants to go uh, out on the limb for anybody else. And um, and I didn't really understand that at first. I thought, hey, you know, if I have the if I have super cool ideas and super cool stories, then I'm good. Like eventually, like somebody's going to take a chance. Um, but I kept I kept running into this this same problem of like, oh, it's not established IP. Uh, we, you know, sitting with, um, and a lot of people were super nice and encouraging, but, um, uh, you know, sitting with Sony, sitting with, uh, Warner brothers, these big companies were like, yeah, it's just not, it's, it, it needs to be based on a book and it needs to be based on all this other stuff. Uh, I, I was sitting with the guy at CBS the guy had a, a, a overall deal with CBS and I, and he, and he said they were looking for a new sci-fi series for their, um, for their CBS all access, uh, their, uh, our CBS digital channel that they were creating and they wanted something edgy and cool. And I said, Oh, cool. I got one for you. Let me pitch it to you. And I pitched it to him and it was a, this cloning concept that was cool and interesting. And he said, dude, that's perfect. He said, Houston, that's like exactly what we're looking for. And he's like, it's edgy. It's raw. He said, it's kind of like orphan black, but not really like orphan black. He said, this is exactly what we're looking for. And I thought that's awesome. Home run. Home run. Right. And uh, and he said, what what book is it based off of? And I said, it's not based off a book. It's my own original idea. And he and, and his whole body language changed. He just like dropped his shoulders like, oh, and I was like, what's wrong? He said, it needs to be based off a book. And I was like, no, 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 it doesn't have to be based off a book because you just heard the idea and said it was perfect. You said yeah. it's ex exactly what you need. It's, it, it's it's he said, yeah, but. He said, it really needs to be based off a book. So, uh, so is there a way that we could go find a book that it's kind of like, and then option that book and then say, this is based off that book. And I said, this is the stupidest conversation I've ever had <laughs> with anybody because he's you, in the box, yeah, he's in that box, in the box. And this can't guy, get out. And this guy's like super successful. Yeah. Right. And it, like, if I told you his name, you would know him. And, and, uh, and, and, and I was like, what? Like, I don't even understand what you're saying. Does it, I thought he was joking. Like that's, it was so ridiculous. Yeah. And, and I said, I don't, I don't understand. You said it's perfect. You said it's exactly what you're looking for. And he said, Houston, it is perfect. It is exactly what I'm looking for, but I can't take it to my bosses and pitch this to the studio without it being based on a book. Because if I do, then I'm the one taking the risk on you. So if it pans out, who's going to get the blame? me and i don't i don't want to put it's you know my head formulaic no. i mean that's they they've got it down to a that's it this is how it works it's all about how how do you shift the blame to someone else because if 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 it's based on the book that sold five hundred thousand copies right and then you 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 make it a tv show you make it a movie and it doesn't pan out then you can say wait a minute no it's not my fault because it was you know five hundred thousand people bought this book it's a successful book like you know it was the director's fault it was the actor's fault the producer's fault the writer's fault somebody else's fault but mine which means i get to keep my job for a little bit longer hmm. because you know the, the you, you know and not, listen I, I i have empathy for that like i understand like you know they're they 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 have they make great money they have 
big mortgages, big car payments. They've got kids in private school. Uh, they, they, you know, they, they fund a very specific lifestyle and they got the premium health insurance. They're not operating an HMO, right? They got the PPO, <laughs> like they got the whole yeah. the deal. And, and so, so to the put behind them already. Absolutely. Right. So, so they're, they're not incentivized to try to really dig these diamonds out of the rough. They're like, they just want to maintain, which is why, which is why they sit, they sit in prevent defense the whole game. Right. And which is dumb. Like I always hate it when I'm watching like, 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 like the last few minutes of a game when, uh, when a, a certain defense is working the entire game and then the team drops back in prevent and it's just like, and the like, games oh. ends up being close. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Keep doing what you were doing. Uh, but that's just not the way people operate, right? We get defensive, we try to protect, and and that's every single person in the entertainment industry. Because you got people at the top, you got people at the bottom, and but the entire industry is made up of middle managers, of executive, creative, mm -hmm. they don't call them middle right. managers, they're creative executives, right? Yeah. They're all smart, awesome, wonderful people. Well, not all, but like most of them are. I'm like, I'm not talking bad about them, but they're not incentivized to take risk. It's it, you keep your job a little bit longer the more you say no. And there's enough out there that you don't have to take the ones with yep. the risk attached. Absolutely right. Absolutely so how do right. you change that? You're you're the change maker. Yeah. You're coming in with this new idea. How does that start to flip? Because I know yep. you've garnered enough attention now yeah. that, that people are interested. So that's when I, stop, I stopped looking at the transmedia game as just console video games and movies and TV and sort of all the big stuff that, that the studios really operate in. And I started then also looking at the small stuff, it's this small stuff, uh, because he was like, it needs to be based on the book. And I said, great, I'll go write a book. Right. Mm -hmm. And what's awesome is the barrier to entry to write a book right now is very low. But what's interesting about it in Hollywood right now, the most option things in Hollywood aren't books. Their podcast, their short stories on Wattpad. They're, they're, Hollywood executives aren't, you know, bibliophiles. They are not book lovers. They don't, they're not heavy readers uh, just because they love books. They love the audience that goes with the book. Mm -hmm. And historically speaking, the only way to generate an audience as a creator was through a book. But now in a, in a democratized technological society with all these digital platforms, the way you build audience can come from, you know, a hundred different ways. And so if you build an audience on TikTok of, you know, 20 million people, that's the same as selling 20 million books, maybe even actually better at this point. And so then I started to pivot my thinking from the big transmedia elements to say, okay, now how can we also add an element to this model, which is all about how do we launch? How do we ignite this thing and attack the market as, uh, through digital platforms that have high organic growth, things like TikTok, things like podcasts, things like short stories of Wattpad, Webtoon, things like that. And how do we build pre-awareness in the market to where all of a sudden you have an established brand at that point that then makes it easier then to go in and uh, uh, sell something for film and television, things like that. With some momentum, hundred percent behind it. Yeah, I, I know this guy who who went into Warner Brothers and he pitched a um, he pitched a, a a cartoon about um, about vehicles, right? Just like uh, like uh, uh, cars that talk, right? Yeah. And um, and Warner Brothers passed because it was an established IP, right? They they liked the story, was an established IP. Uh, then they actually called him back and said, Hey, can we make one of the cars, the Batmobile? Can we make one of the cars, like a Superman car? Can we make a, like the wonder woman car? And can we make them all superhero cars? And he was like, sure. Sold. So the creative idea didn't change at all. Like the story didn't change at all. Mm -hmm. The only thing that changed was they applied brand to it. Right. So they just took a installed audience and put them right in this new story. That's it brand is the thing that kind of pushed it over the 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 top of the hill right and uh and and, and that's the mentality i have a buddy who, who who told me he's an executive senior vp of development and he 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 tells me houston do you know how we decide between which script to make if we can't decide between the two and and i said no like what do you flip a coin what do you do and i kind of joke and he's like no it's worse than that he said we go to the <laughs> instagram accounts of the two writers and see who has more instagram followers and then we make that movie. And, wow. and this is a major studio. And I, and, and I said, 
are you serious? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. And it's because nobody wants to take the chance at the unproven thing, because if you do and it doesn't work, then all of a sudden, onus, for, onus is on, on you. You. Yeah. you think about it from a music perspective in the music industry, right? Uh, uh, you know, Cardi B, when she signed with Atlantic Records, she signed a, with a $5 million advance, which is like a really large advance, right? On, on average. And uh, especially today's market, like people For aren't sure. people aren't getting like the Tupac advance anymore, no, right? Like no. it's just a, so she gets a five million dollar advance when usually the, right now the average is sitting about two hundred and two hundred fifty thousand right. uh, dollars for these advances, uh, and she gets a five million dollar advance when she's breaking in, right, for her first album. And and listen, I'm not hating on Cardi B; she's doing her, you know, she's a hustler, and that's great. But she didn't get that five million dollar advance because she's that much more talented than all these other people. Absolutely not. Why did she get that $5 million advance? Is because she was massive on Instagram. She was on that For Love and Hip Hop show with, uh, who was it? Uh, the guy with the big uh, clock. What was it? Oh. Flavor Flav. Yeah. There we Flavor go. Flavor. Yeah, yeah. Flavor yeah, yeah. Flav. Right. Uh, so uh, uh, my, my 80s hip hop knowledge failed me for a second. Uh, but, <laughs> it comes uh, with age. Yeah. So um, uh, like people knew who she was, right? And all of a sudden, she, and see, we know, and you know, that 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 the A and R guy that discovered her made that deal with her, that person could take that five, took that five million dollars and signed a hundred undiscovered acts that had more talent than her, right? Yeah. Probably like let's I think I think that's set, probably safe to say wrought with risk hundred percent because if those if they flush out for reasons that like it could be a hundred different reasons why they don't work out, no. then all of a sudden he's the one that took the risk or she's the one that took the risk and and their job is on the line so all of a sudden the safe bet is to now go with cardi b if you watch shark tank right this is even a, not even an entertainment thing because once i figured this out then i saw it everywhere it's like you know like like when you when you buy a new car then you see that same car everywhere it's sort of like yeah. one of those phenomena for me watching shark tank people come in and pitch their, their their stuff the very first question that the sharks ask the person is how many of you sold? What's your pre-awareness, mm -hmm. right? Like what, like, and, and it's, it's, I, you know, I, I haven't been, this is anecdotal. I haven't been actually keeping track. I, I can't remember a Shark Tank episode where somebody was pre-launch, pre-revenue, haven't sold anything and ever got a deal. Like it, it's, it's, I mean, it, you could probably count on like one hand the times that it's probably actually happened. I mean, people coming in there is like selling five hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff still aren't aren't getting deals, but th they want to see investors want to see a track record. Yeah. They want to see an audience. They want to see what have you done in the market, and is there some sort of brand there established in pre awareness? And 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 once I figured that out, and I'm like, okay, it's awesome to plan for movies and games and you know TV and all this stuff. But you also have to have the component of how do I launch in order to establish that brand in order to grow. Now, if you're Mattel working on a Mattel project or the Disney Imagineers, like, then you don't need that, right? But if you're an independent creator trying to shop a project, then all of a sudden this, this changes the whole game for you. Because most creators, most creators want, want just to sell the script. So I just want to sell the script. I just want to sell the script for a million bucks and like, you know, do the, then go to the next one. Right. Mm -hmm. That is, is like sitting back on your own one yard line, chucking a Hail Mary down the field. Right. Every now and then that works, but you can spend, you can spend 20 years trying to really do that and it not work. And then you, you burn 20 years. Yeah. Right. And so, all of a sudden, looking at things like podcast and, and, and webtoon and things like that, TikTok videos, is, is it's not the big Hail Mary you're looking for. It's not the touchdown you're looking for, but it's the, you know, the 10 yard out pattern. It's the this the four yard off tackle run. It's, you know, it's all these little chunk plays that'll get you up to the 50 yard line. And then you can throw a Hail Mary from the 50, which is still a you know risky and you know who knows what'll happen, but I would rather throw a Hail Mary from the 50. Than the one but then it even gets worse <clears throat> because once really what it's like is most creators think they're at the one yard line throwing a hail mary down the field 
when they're really not even in the stadium. Because it was such a big realization moment for me about all this of like, okay, this is actually how Hollywood proper works. If you have an established brand for your project, you're not even in the stadium playing the same game. You're playing touch football in the parking lot, thinking you're in the in the game, but you're not really. And it's tragic because then 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 you see people spend 12, 13, 14 years and never achieve the things they want to achieve. And they don't understand why not, why they didn't. And they think it's because they're, they're not as talented or they think that, that you know, they just think Hollywood's rigged and things like that. Uh, it's all about who you know and things like that. And, uh, but really it was, they'd never, they never really established brand. And so, so that, so over the past three or four years, my big focus has been less working with studios and been more working with independent creators on how do you create a project that's optimized for multi-platform uh, performance and expansion? Uh, and then how do you create a, a growth strategy that can allow you to attack the market in ways that establish brand early, but, but then also scale organically into the bigger stuff that you want? And that that I find is has been super interesting and uh, uh, a lot more rewarding you know yeah for, well for and is it is obviously fascinating to me there's the the whole concept and how to wrap as, as as a layman sometimes it's difficult to actually figure all that out sure you, you think differently you've already yeah admitted this yeah so my th think differently is how do i even explain to someone not even what a specific project sure. is but just explaining transmedia in a handful of sentences yeah and what it is do you have like a short pitch on what essentially it is that you do sure so uh transmedia is the art of telling a story across multiple mediums and platforms in a way that creates um an ecosystem of content or or uh a way that where all those story, stories work together for one bigger story, right? And what this does, it creates a completely new experience for the audience and it creates a new business model for the creators. So if you think of something like what Marvel's doing uh, with, with, uh, with all their superhero stuff, uh, it's a lot of different stories told on a lot of different platforms. You have television, you have movie, you have animation, all these different things, uh, but they're standalone, but at the same time, they all still work in concert together for one bigger thing. And you see that in Marvel, you see it in, in Star Wars, you see it in The Matrix and things like that, some of the big franchisey stuff. There's also a lot of interesting small versions of that uh, in the music industry, in the game industry. Um, but ultimately, it's just using all the tools in the toolbox. Like what's available uh, to me as a creator and how can I use all of these things to tell different parts of the story, almost like puzzle pieces? And so the podcast is going to tell a unique part of the story that's a puzzle piece. And that puzzle piece will work with the short stories that tell a different piece of the puzzle. And those will work with the, the animated short film that I released that's a different piece of the puzzle. And by the time I lay all these pieces of the puzzles together, it's going to form a bigger picture that's the bigger puzzle. And there are standalones as well. Sure. Like you said. Yeah. Absolutely. Because th So then it's like more the analogy of a photo mosaic where you have a bunch of individual photos that when you lay them all together and take you know five steps back it forms those bigger pictures right go. uh and so there's different ways to do it tactically sometimes you want the puzzle piece and sometimes you want the mosaic depend on some creative and business objectives um but but ultimately it's the same it's the same uh school of thought of how do i tell multiple stories over th multiple mediums and platforms in a way to have them all work together and that allows me to tr attract different audiences, it, it create different revenue streams, uh, hedge risk for investors, right. and uh, achieve some different goals throughout. So, so um, my other thing was, I know you're uh, passionate about positive, um, positive subjects. Sure, uh, we've talked about different things that inspire you and inspire other people. So. Yeah. What are, are you working towards specifically? I, I've only had a glimpse into some of the projects you're working sure. on, so no need to go specific if, yeah. it's, if it's improper to, but what types of projects attract you uh, and what types of uh, you know, causes or purposes do you typically find yourself wanting to work with? Sure. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real sort of missional guy. I, uh, you know, I've always... I've always been drawn to purpose driven projects 
And um, now, I mean, gosh, man, uh, you know, the world's on fire in 10,000 different ways. And there's so much darkness and terrible things happening uh, from school shootings to fires to like the pandemic that deleted two years of life uh, and and everything in between. Or maybe it's just me being in L.A. during the pandemic. Maybe <laughs> that, maybe in the rest of the world. Not the, the, two whole years. Two, just, yeah, OK, it's kind of months. a year for everyone else. OK, yeah. there we go. Uh, in L.A., it's, it was just two <laughs> solid years. Uh, but um, uh, but, you know, there's there's so much there's so much junk out there. And, uh, you know, I'm a dad and I got two two littles at the at the house. And, uh, you know, I think the responsibility of the creator is not just how to tell a great story, but how to tell a great story that is imbued with some positive something that could impact the individual's life, but also make the world a better place. You can do that in a lot of ways, but I, I'm completely convinced whether it's whether it's a Dune or whether it's Star Wars or whether it's Lord of the Rings or Chronicles of Narnia, that the, the, the projects that stand the test of time aren't just cool hooks that have big explosions and cool characters. They're, they're projects that are laced in, in the DNA of the project with a perspective of the creator about a commentary on the world and, and, and how the world should be and it's not and, and, and trying to move culture in, in a certain way. And, uh, and those are the things that resonate with audiences. Uh, I think if you don't, if you don't embed your your entertainment, whether it's music, whether it's film or a, a book, if you don't embed your entertainment with something deeper than just a surface level entertainment hook, it's going to be if it works, it'll just be popcorn entertainment uh, that that is going to be like a sugar rush that people will will think is cool, but it won't sustain them over time. And so I look at I look at things like 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 Tolkien and Hemingway and um, Tupac. And even like and, 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 and the great creators had depth to them and they understood how to embed their perspective and how to try to move the needle in some way that was beyond just a cool song or a cool book. And so I really try to do that. I, I really uh, think about like, what do I think about the world? What's my perspective on stuff and whether it's geopolitics or whether it's uh, local politics, whether it's religious topics, whether it's philosophical topics, whether it's relational th stuff or or, you know, even even, you know, just small things that just like small uh, experiences that uh, that I've been through. And, and what have I learned from those experiences? And, and we all we all have experiences and we all uh, uh, learn from hopefully learn from them and we all take away uh, uh, interesting things from them. So, you know, I work with creators all the time trying to figure out how to draw that out. And because I'm always trying to draw it out of myself and it's. It, it's problematic and troubling how many people don't take the time to figure out even what they want to say. Uh, uh, and because they don't do any sort of self inventory, they don't pray, they don't meditate, they don't think about stuff. Everything's just happening so fast. They are operating on surface level. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've, I, you know, work with, um, uh, this one, this one guy who's a vet it was, uh, I'll never forget this project. He said, uh, uh, you know, he, he wanted to create this, this transmedia project. And he said, um, and, and he said, uh, his, his lesson that he learned through the the service because i was trying to get him to like what you learn like right. he went through like four tours right of afghanistan iraq i mean this guy's like you know and i was like what like what was what was that like and what did you what did you learn on the other side of it and and uh and he was a corpsman and he uh and i thought like i mean this guy literally was like like on the battlefield like had his hand in people's chest like manually beating their heart for them yeah. until the helicopter like you know, the guy learned some stuff and this he, is going to be deep this is going to be deep and he said <laughs> he said well he said really the major the, the most important thing i learned through my my career in the military was don't marry a stripper <laughs> and 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 i thought he was joking and i was like and, and he's like no seriously i married three and 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 he did he, like over the course of his whole like being in the military, he's traveling different places, based on different things. He married three strippers. And I said, well, why, why shouldn't you marry strippers? And he said, well, listen, he said, all strippers have baggage. So when you marry a stripper, you don't just marry the stripper, you marry the baggage. And, and then he started talking to me about 
his experience fleshed out man that really was profound it was quickly not as funny as it started yeah and went he went through some stuff that was crazy absolutely crazy you know coming home one day uh you know he had a baby with one of them and coming home one day and she was a drug addict and uh they had a infant they had their infant there and he came home and you know uh, liquor bottles were empty and there was a, another guy passed out on the floor with coke lines on the table and she she had coke all over her her lip and she had a gun to the head of their kid threatening to kill everybody like went completely you know off the rails yeah. and i just sat there for hours just listening to this guy's story and he has so he had an an honest perspective of like man he's like i want to tell the people like don't make the same mistakes i made yeah right and it actually was crafted into a really really super interesting project yeah. right and so so i love that process whether you know i'm talking to somebody and I, you know they say the thing i love more on earth is that than is giraffes i love giraffes and and because of this and and because my my grandpa took me to the zoo as a kid and we always went to the draft thing and so like i love giraffes and 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 figuring out how to take that and 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 turn it into something about you know spending time with your grandparents and things Parental like that relationships yeah. yeah stuff like that and so so that for me is super fun and meaningful and when you can start to hit that note and 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 really tap that vein you really elevate projects. So, so uh, you know, the projects that I've, I'm internally developing right now are, are, are really embedded with that in, in a really interesting way. Uh, one big one that I'm working on, I'm working on the, probably the most ambitious world building project I've ever embarked upon. Uh, it's absolutely bananas how, how deep and big this thing is developing, um, but it's all built on truth and light. And uh, if any, uh, we live in a world that's super dark and uh, and truth is the truth is an interesting topic right now of like relative. Yeah. What is truth (laughs) and disinformation and all this stuff. And uh, it's, you know, the the, the benefit and necessity of both truth and light and building an entire multiverse project out of that. Uh, It's early stage development, but it's like, you know. I can't wait to show it to you once once it's, it's like it's it's I can't wait to see it. It's bananas. It's crazy. Uh and um also working on a project been working on it for a few years uh called uh, the Black and Power project and it's about how do we tell uh find uh unknown or untold stories in black American history and telling those stories in a way that all link together for this cool transmedia mm-hmm. uh effect. And um uh it, and you know I'm passionate about that primarily because I think right now the narrative in um, uh, for African Americans in this country is very negative. Uh, you look at the entertainment uh, industry and I feel like African American entertainment is centered on slavery or Selma and um, and a lot of depressing disempowering things that are that are blights on his, on our American history and uh, but uh, but there's also a lot of awesome things that nobody knows and uh, that can actually empower people. Because if all people do is look at depressing, terrible things and think about their past, they're not gonna be able to build their future in a way that's more positive. They're just gonna become grizzled. And you can see that, You can that's a principle from the Bible that you can, uh, secular psychologists will tell you the same thing. If you, It's called rumination. If you just ruminate constantly on negative, you'll never grow into anything positive. Right. And so so I, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, ignore the tragedies of the past or pretend like they didn't happen i just want to give give folks some different things to ruminate on and let's ruminate on some positive things and things like you know uh uh some awesome stories from um uh like like for example you know the lone the lone ranger the original lone ranger was actually uh, a black guy a cowboy named bass reeves uh and it was the greatest lawman in the old west uh uh wyatt earp said he wasn't uh, Wyatt Earp said about himself, he said, I'm not I'm not good enough to be uh, a patch on this guy's pants. This guy was ambidextrous. He was he he uh, he, he captured three thousand uh, uh, criminals uh, in fugitives back in the old west. Guy was amazing. Um, uh, there was a, a, a story about how um, uh, slaves that were funneled into Canada during the uh, through the Underground Railroad actually invented hockey, uh, which is very much a white man sport. 
okay. uh, <laughs> right? Very much. But it was actually invented. Modern hockey was invented by um, by uh, African American slaves that got funneled up into Nova Scotia. Uh, and at the time, hockey was was more like um, uh, curling. Like uh, Lord Stanley's mm -hmm. hockey was like slow, and the puck was big, and uh, it was very much just curling. And uh, when when these slaves got up there, they were used to playing baseball and things like that. Uh, and they um, when when they got up to Nova Scotia, they started skating fast. They invented the slap uh, the the uh, uh, slap, slap shot. shot. They they uh, decreased the size of the puck. They started checking each other. They invented modern hockey and created something called the Colored Hockey League. That was the most popular sport in Canada. Uh, Five thousand people would huddle around these little ponds just to watch these guys play in an intramural league. Uh, that was started. Uh, so things like that. It was really super, uh, you know, about Black Wall Street in Tol Tulsa, Oklahoma, and like what the, the way that that was like, you know, the, the most prosperous group of African Americans uh, that we had in the country, like or in the whole world outside of, you know, princes in Africa. Yeah. And a lot of these stories are are amazing and and you no one's ever heard them and yeah. and they're empowering. And and the story of African Americans in this country is 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 more robust than what the news media or what uh, Hollywood says. And and so, but what's interesting, what got me into that was was uh, several years ago, um, I, I found out that my great grandmother was black. And that's something I'd never known before. I mean, I was hmm. like 39 years old uh, when I when I found that out. Wow. And uh, it was really, it was really this. Hence the deep tan you have. That's it. We that's have it. matching. <laughs> Matching it. skin tones here. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, uh, uh, you know, uh, all I knew about my grandpa was my mom's dad was, uh, uh, he grew up in an orf orphanage, the orphanage burned down, don't know anything about him, about his life, about his, you know, any, uh, when his birthday was, um, but he always had a really good tan and, and I didn't understand why. Uh, but, um, and then, you know, then he died, but then, uh, then later, uh, I mean, like literally like, you know, uh, three, four years ago, I was talking to my sister and sh and she mentioned my great grandma being black. And I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, what well, great grandma? I don't know who you're talking about. Yeah. And so she had gone back and like unearthed a bunch of stuff and talked to my mom. And, and so my, my, my great grandma was black, married a white guy in West Virginia. And this was like early 1900s yeah uh slightly faux pas yeah yeah not <laughs> not not a great place to have an interracial relationship yeah and uh my my great grandpa got called to uh got uh, called to the war and uh which left my great grandma raising my grandpa wow. uh, in west virginia by herself and it was tragic because when my grandpa left the everyone in the town refused to feed her like nobody would sell her groceries. Nobody would would let her like would give her food from their farms. No, no like like re refused to feed her, wow. and she starved to death. And that's how my great grandma died. And that's how my grandpa ended up in an orphanage, right? And it was why this wild, horrible, tragic story. And but that put me put me on to this interesting uh this interesting path of like figuring out stuff in black history an empathetic trail when i was a kid uh my my mom and dad would take me my brother and my sister we would go to this event in uh in cincinnati ohio called the black family reunion and uh and it was just a <laughs> it was just an african-american festival yeah. Of like the black family, let's all get together on the riverfront and let's cook out and have vendors and that do. I mean, thousands of people would go, and we would go, and we would be the only white people. And but I always just thought it was cool. Like I got like you know, all, you, I, I remember I loved the Negro leagues. I always played baseball, and uh, I loved Negro leagues. And so they would have like Negro league shirts and things like that. I buy jerseys. Oh wow! And 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 I always just thought it was like a like my parents, which they were always very good about getting us out of Eastern Kentucky trying to force us into a, like a cultural mentality, yeah. you know, to broaden our perspective. So we didn't fall into that small town, Eastern Kentucky mindset. Um, but really it was like, my mom knew some stuff. She's like, it was painful for her to talk about. And, uh, but she was still trying to like sneak it in there a little bit. And so it was just a really interesting thing that was going on. And, and so, so that kind of got me onto that path. And, and, and so I think that's a really, strong interesting positive purpose that you see what's going on in in, in the country 
so much division, so much racial division. There's a lot of tragic stuff still happening that I feel like in the midst of tragedy, we got to force ourselves to continue to look at the good in some way. So, so do you think Hollywood is, they're making deliberate steps to try to get out of the, mm -hmm. the box that they're in, in terms of, uh, equality and, and some of those empathetic stories, perhaps, sure. do you think that something like this, these transmedia projects are going to move it in that direction where they catch on to a lot of stuff? Or is it, I mean, a lot of it at this point almost seems contrived. They're sure. Doing their best. But do you, do you see a movement headed in that direction? I hope so. I mean, I'll, I'm always like an eternal optimist. I'm not, I'm not never sort of the grizzled, uh, cynical guy. I think so. I mean, there's a lot of awesome, great people in Hollywood. And I think Hollywood's making a lot of great strides into a more holistic approach of hiring and, uh, and, and, and looking at different voices and different perspectives, um, for creators. There's a lot of people in Hollywood that have agendas that do it for the wrong reasons that try to check off a list and yeah. it feels contrived it's not authentic and there's a lot there's there's a, there's a lot wrong with hollywood but there's a lot of good people trying to do a lot of good things and so uh i always like to try to bet on the good guy uh when and out and there's a lot of bad people trying to do a lot of bad stuff too uh but but uh, but i i think i think we're you know i think the streamers have helped i think uh, you know, Amazon and Apple and uh, and Netflix have 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 created enough competition to where if the traditional studios don't fall in line, then uh, uh, that that they're going to get left behind pretty fast. Yeah. And so uh, and so whether that's authentic or not, probably not in a lot of ways. A lot of times it is. We'll see. But I think it's moving in the right direction. Not there yet. Um, but it but it's an interesting it's an interesting conversation. And, uh, you know, have how, you know, cause I think a lot of when we're talking about like, you know, the DEI and, and, and inclusion and all that, I think a lot of that can be problematic sometimes when you're looking at history, I was talking to, you know, uh, a guy that was developing a world war one video game at a studio and the studio notes were the, the soldiers need to be a certain percentage female and a certain percentage African-American. And they're like, that wasn't world it's war one historical. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. uh, uh, you know, they were all like white kids that were like, you know, white 20 year olds that were fighting the war. Like, you know, yeah. and so they felt like they were going to, uh, 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 sacrifice the, the accuracy of the history. Yeah. Integrity uh, of the film itself. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I want to be empathetic to, to the black kid that pulls up a video game and they don't see themselves in the video game and, and how that would feel. Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm empathetic to that as well. I'm not sure the answer. I think we just try to move the needle as much as we can try uh, trying to be as empathetic as we can and, and, and thoughtful as we can. Um, but you know, uh, sometimes it feels forced. Sometimes it's good, but I, I, I hope we figure out the way forward with these yeah, sorts of projects. Sometimes being contrived is still not con continuing to be ignorant. Sure. You're forced to kind of try something and when yeah. it succeeds, you open your eyes to something like oh, this kind of worked out. Okay. And 100%. maybe, a, and, and there's a newer generation coming through, you know, Absolutely. you're working with a lot of them. So sure. I think there's, there's going to be a lot of that. I just didn't know how it was. I know it's trending in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. So just, I know you have a, a little better view of that than sure. I would. So, yeah. well, man, your, your time is valuable. And I, I really appreciate you taking time to, to scoot over here and chat about this stuff. Probably chalk two more hours. Sure. Up, but yeah, I shan't. All but, right. Well, bring me back another time for yeah. a sequel. Oh, yeah. When you have that other project, you share it. Done. You'll find a good reason to do it. Sold. Thank you, brother. Thanks, man. Appreciate yes. you. Keep on keeping on the golden age caffeine. It's some side wind you're on. Another situation. See the road from the stripes with the lights coming on. Freedom came upon a catastrophic dream. Another dark page to turn Another situation They can't have your heart to find To pursue what's has just another time And every wish ain't hope till the soul is mine but Keep your muse on hope till your angel cries A sunlit passer on Obscure majestic trees Can't see which way to turn Just take
Station. from 